Joe Becker is a Mises U graduate and a Mises Institute Associated Scholar who earned his master's degree in economics under Murray Rothbard at UNLV. Today, Joe heads up the Nevada Public Research Institute Center for Justice, where he sues government agencies on behalf of plaintiffs with sympathetic libertarian causes. Joe is a dedicated Rothbardian libertarian, and you'll enjoy his thoughts about the illusion of judicial remedies for most Americans, how he's attacking cronyism in Nevada, how a Rothbardian legal system might deal with torts, crimes, and externalities, and how the status 20th century course created a phony legal distinction between fundamental liberties and economic liberties. Stay tuned. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to Mises Weekends. I'm your host, Jeff Deist, and I'm very pleased to be joined this weekend by not only an old friend of mine, but an old friend of the Mises Institute, Joe Becker, who is calling us from Reno, Nevada. Joe, how are you this weekend? Uh, I'm doing all right. Of course, you listen to an old friend is old, and I don't especially like that, but it's supposed to tackle, Jeff. Well, I prefer the term middle age for both of us, but let me ask you this, Joe, you sue federal and state agencies for a living, as we alluded to in the intro, and of course, many of your clients themselves don't have the financial means to hire private lawyers and protect themselves against government agencies that aggress against them. So unlike, let's say, Mark Cuban, who has billions of dollars in armies of lawyers, and he was able to successfully defend himself against the SEC... I just wonder if for the average American, the notion of redress in court has become an illusory remedy, so to speak. Yeah, well, it's certainly tough. I mean, we, we're, we're what's called a public interest legal foundation here uh, that, I, that I had, and we represent people uh, uh, with no legal fees to them, but of course that means we have to find uh, donors who are you know, willing to contribute to help stop the expansion of government, and we, we sue people. Uh, we see government, I should say, when government sees its constitutional limits, which, of course, is, is very frequent. I, I'm reminded of a case I did uh, in Arizona a few years back where we had the first fast food owner in the town of Page, Arizona, just on the southern tip of Lake Powell. And uh, he wound up, he hired like 95% Navajo from the reservation around him. And at some point, you got a couple of bad, bad hires, and they started sexually harassing um the customers as well as their fellow employees in Navajo. So in order, in order not to run afoul of the EEOC's uh, hostile workplace regulations, he decided to implement a language program where when they're on the clock, uh, they could speak only English. So he and his manager could monitor what was being said to try and, you know, protect against this hostile workplace. So of course, instead he got sued for, uh, national origin discrimination against, against Navajos. Uh, he, he wound up trying to do that on his own, and he racked up about $150,000 in legal fees before he finally decided to let the public interest uh, firm represent him. And, I mean, that, that's kind of what happens. In fact, in that, in that vein, what, what the government does in that case is there's no – the law was on its side. But the problem is, is they try and bully the EEOC, tried to bully people into settling because they like the idea that language is a you know, protected class or a discriminatory class. And so they would, you know, basically sue people, bully them into settling, and then they would run press releases and said, see, this is what happens when you have a language, uh, you know, when you have a language policy in the workplace. So yeah, it can be, it can be daunting and, and almost impossible for some people to stand up for their constitutional rights. That's why. You know, organizations like, like ours uh, exist. Now, before you came to NPRI and before you became a lawyer, I know that you studied under Murray Rothbard at UNLV, and you were even kind enough to introduce me to him at that time. Tell us a little bit about your master's thesis at UNLV and having not only Murray, but also Hans Hermann Hoppe on your thesis committee. Yeah, that was a conscious decision. I mean, this goes back to the uh, 88 Libertarian the president campaign of Ron Paul, that's kind of how I first got introduced to the Austrian school. And Ron sort of directed me towards the Mises Institute and the Mises University, which back then, of course, was being um, operated out at Stanford University. And I went there and I met Murray and Hans and just became, I studied a lot of undergraduate economics. I think I had probably 24 hours of undergraduate econ at the time, but no mention, of course, of the Austrian school and curriculums those days. Uh, I understand it's slightly better now, thanks to you know your group. But um, 
Yeah, so I got I got directed towards them, and I made a conscious decision that I would go to UNLV where they were, and that's where I would do my graduate work in economics, and it was turned out to be you know, probably one of the best decisions in my life. Uh, you mentioned the master's thesis. What I did, you know, and in retrospect, it probably wasn't as good as it could have been because I hadn't yet been to law school, but uh, certainly had a, a sound understanding of real economics by the time I got through two years with, with Hans and Murray, and I, I wrote a master's thesis. It was an Austrian uh, examination of a recent Supreme Court decision at the time, which was Lucas v. Uh, South Carolina Coastal Commission. This was a, a, uh, I don't know, a landmark regulatory takings case, the regulatory taking being distinguished from you know, the, the per se take or the physical invasion take, because you know, here we had a guy in South Carolina that spent, I think, around a million dollars for some land to develop. And between the time he bought it and when he first uh, put up his structures, the uh, Coastal Commission had enacted a law that, that uh, prohibited any permanent habitable structures from being erected on this particular piece of land that he bought. And he's like, wait a minute. I mean, sure, you didn't physically come on my land and, and, and put some government device there, but he, in essence, regulated away my right to make certain physical uses of that property. And, and of course, you know, the government didn't want to pay him because they said, well, you still have title to the property. And the decision was 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 good only in a factual way, but it set a bad precedent. I mean, it, it requires for someone to be paid, basically, all economically viable use to be taken away. And, of course, then you've got the fight between the dissent and the majority. The dissent saying, hey, you can still pitch a tent on that property. It's not worthless. And, and so you get sort of a bad rule, but because the court determined as a factual matter that they had denied him all economic viable use of the property, you know, he wound up uh, not, not, not being quite as bad off as he could have been. But, yeah, so, I, I you know, I looked at the you know, kind of applied the Austrian school methodology to, uh, you know, that opinion and, and uh, you know, came out pretty hard against both the majority and minority, as I recall. So later you go on to law school and you wrote a law review article also featuring an Austrian school critique of, I guess, the legal cases behind the phony distinction we now suffer under between so-called fundamental freedoms, let's say personal freedoms, and what courts increasingly call mere, in quotes, mere economic freedoms. Yeah, that was, uh, I, I, I think that was a much better piece in, in retrospect. I, you know, I can still hear Murray Rothbard was talking about, you know, what good is freedom of the press if you don't have the right to own paper and ink? And of course, you know, I mean, we're, we're a number of years later, so maybe we would say, uh, right to own a laptop and, and, uh, an ISP. You know, service with an ISP, but no, I mean, the, the distinction between so-called fundamental liberties, which get a completely different uh, level of protection uh, in the, uh, under constitutional review than economic liberties, uh, it, it's senseless to try and say, you know, that economic liberties are entitled to certain protections and, and personal liberties are, are entitled to more. And that, yeah, that was, uh, that was, I, I, I did an end, because it wasn't really an economic uh, journal it was a law journal. I did a, a, a good amount of explaining the Austrian school methodology, and then applied that to you know, sort of the uh, the New Deal courts treatment of of these two different liberties, and which are you know, inextricably intertwined. They can't be separated and given different levels of judicial scrutiny. So, you know, that that was. Uh, but again, that was you know that was uh, the time I spent with Murray and Hans was invaluable in law school as well as you know what I do now. I I'm always making economic arguments as to why the Constitution be, should, has to be interpreted uh, to mean you know, that government shouldn't be interfering in the marketplace. And of course, that was the constitutional doctrine at the time as well. Well, we were speaking off mic about the lawsuit that you're currently prosecuting involving the Nevada, Nevada, Nevada Governor's Office of Economic Development, which, from wh- how you've described it, sounds like a cronyist office designed to subsidize politically connected companies. Can you tell us a little bit about this suit? Yeah, I, I can certainly do that. It, it's kind of this race to the bottom that uh, states seem to be engaged in. And, uh, you know, many of the Western states, including about perhaps all of the states, uh, to some extent or another, have something in their constitution called the gift clause, which prohibits the state and sometimes political subdivisions from giving gifts to um, to private corporations unless they're charitable or educational. So sometimes there are exceptions for those. So, you know, here we have a situation where 
um, the state of Nevada just decided to give you know millions of dollars to various companies. Uh, we represent an um, alternative energy entrepreneur who is you know doing everything he can to get his business off the ground without subsidies. Meanwhile, a company named Solar City uh, is being subsidized to the tune of 1.2 million. And they're clearly a competitive disadvantage, so they're taking his tax dollars, giving them to you know, a private corporation to, comp- you know, to compete against him. So both, you know, his status as a taxpayer as well as his, as a disadvantaged competitor gives us standing to, to sue the government to invoke this, you know, this, to, to challenge, you know, what the, what the Nevada is doing. And like I say, it's not unique to Nevada, but, uh, the, uh, the organization I run right now is, is focused on what's going on in Nevada. So that's, that's what we're doing. Well, it's interesting to me that your client even has standing to sue the state of Nevada, given the doctrine of sovereign immunity that, in effect, protects the political class and protects government against lawsuits by private citizens. I know that in your line of work, you have come up against the doctrine of sovereign immunity quite frequently. I was hoping you could discuss and elaborate on what the doctrine means for us. Well, it, it's really an abomination, uh, and, um, you know, I... It, 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 it's a whole number from monarchical times when the notion was that the king could do no wrong. And so, I mean, in a nutshell, what it means is that you you can only sue the government when the government gives you permission to do so. Now, it's a little bit easier uh, in the case of uh, the, the GOED the case, the Governor's Office of Economic Development, because they were operating under directly under a, um, you know, challenging their unconstitutional action that they were really asking for and not money damages. Uh, We're asking for the government to uh, stop violating the Constitution. We're looking for a declaratory relief saying, a declaration from the court saying, hey, this is unconstitutional, and then injunctive relief, where what we're doing is we're asking for the court to enjoin the other branch, another branch of government, the executive branch, from carrying out this uh, this violation of the Constitution. Where you run into sovereign immunity being a bigger problem is when you're looking for monetary relief from the government. And that, that's especially tough. I, I'm, I'm doing another case here in Nevada, which is suddenly split into three courts. And uh, in that case, we're definitely looking for financial relief. I, I represent a church camp uh, down in southern Nevada that spent half a million dollars for a 40-acre uh, camp where they could operate the church camp. And, um, in the name of this case is a ministerial local Salida versus the U.S. And the reason against, it's against the U.S. is because shortly after they bought the camp, uh, there was this that beautiful uh, spring-fed stream that ran through their property since at least, at least the 1870s and perhaps earlier. Uh, shortly after they purchased the land, U.S. Fish and Wildlife dammed up the water where it entered their property. And they routed it completely around and outside their property, but to the high side of the property. And then they reconnected it at the other end of the property where it used to flow. So in essence, they stole, they stole the spring, which was the baptismal water for the church camp, as well as recreational and, and, and spiritual, it provided spiritual benefits. And they did it in such a way, in fact, that the first time that it rained after, uh, they, they uh, diverted the, the, the spring flow. It, it flooded their properties. It tried to go back to its historic path. It did about ninety thousand dollars worth of damage. So you know, here we have, of course, a free exercise violation because they took away their back, their, their ability to practice their, their, their baptism by immersion. Uh, we have the tort of negligence because they negligently rerouted the water. Of course, it's a taking in addition to that because. You know, water rights in Nevada are such that, you know, vested water rights have been appropriated by the agricultural use of this water, you know, years and years and years ago, going all the way back to the 1800s, taxes paid to, to show that. So when you go after the government for the tort damages of roughly $90,000 and you ask for a taking, you know, because the government t- took the money uh, or took, the, took the, the value of the, the property as well as the water value itself, now you run into a problem because getting money damages against the government, you know, that that's where sovereign immunity comes from. It's a bar. You can only do that when they say they can, that you can. It took until the mid forties, post World War Two, for sovereign immunity to be or for neg- for you to be able to sue the government for negligence or in tort and recover money. In fact it was uh it was a result of a, a plane crash into the Empire State Building in 1945, that actually finally prompted Congress to pass 
the uh, Federal Tort Claim Act to allow that. And as far as takings, um, you know, when you're trying to, even though there's a constitutional provision that says uh, government, you know, can't take for anything but public use, and when they do, they have to, you know, they have to uh, pay pay for it. Uh, you know, it took government a while to come up with the Tucker Act, the Big Tucker Act, and the Little Tucker Act, which allows you to sue government when they actually take your property. So there, even though there's a constitutional prohibition in order to recover money, you have to sue under the under the Tucker Act, and of course, this requires certain courts and certain limits, and it's you know, it's, it's more technical than interesting. But what is interesting is that you know this whole doctrine of sovereign immunity, which really has no place in American jurisprudence. You know, it's very much alive and well. I mean, it's, it's a problem. It, it, it makes things, it makes them stop. Well, you mentioned torts and externalities. Let's talk a bit more about, for instance, the tort system from a Rothbardian perspective. Many people on the right, for example, suggest that medical malpractice is out of control in the United States. And the answer to that is to cap damages, to set a specific cap on monetary damages for, let's say, wrongful death or loss of a limb. And I'd like to get your thoughts on tort reform. Well, you know, of course, every state has a little different approach. It, it, it kind of reminds me of, you know, the necessity notion that there really are, are only two choices. Uh, you've got capitalism or socialism, because if you choose anything in between, you know, the intervention that you initially choose to move away from capitalism, but, you know, true capitalism, not what probably people think of capitalism now, which is, you know, corporatism. Um, but when you deviate from capitalism, of course, that intervention results in negative effects. Those negative effects, then people run back to government to try and try and correct that negative effect with yet another circumvention, which, of course, only begets the next. And so, you know, you, you march happily down, the, or maybe not so happily down the, the road to socialism. You know, here's a case where, you know, like if we talk about medical malpractice, for example, um, a little bit away from the externality, but when you talk about that, you know, if private actors, you, know, you could go to your doctor and say, hey, you know, I'd like to have you, you know, perform some sort of surgery or something on me, and I'm willing to, uh, you know, agree not to sue you for punitive damages or something, but if something goes wrong, it's your fault. You know, obviously, I'd want to be able to do that. You can negotiate some sort of a, a contract to the limit liability between you know, the contracting parties where there's, where there's privity and that, that would be fine. But, you know, to the extent government bans that, uh, now you wind up with government in essence stepping in and deciding for everyone what the right amount of damage liability should be capped at. And, you know, I, I think that's a problem. Um, well, I know it's a problem uh, because, you know, in essence, what you do then, maybe not in the context of medical malpractice exactly, but, you know, if, for example, you're going to be involved in some sort of a, uh, manufacturing uh, project which uh, ultimately winds up harming someone else's property in the libertarian sense, whether that be particulate matter or, or uh, you know, some sort of scorched earth thing. And the government steps in and they cap the damages that someone can get against the corporation, you know, just because the corporation happens to be, you know, crummied up, if you will, with, with the government people passing the form. Then what you've done is you've capped the externalities. You've allowed you know, one entity to harm another, uh, and the whole goal, uh, you know, should be, you know, setting up property rights is to internalize the, the, the costs upon the person, the manufacturer in this case. And, and so, yeah, there, I mean, there's some real problems with, I mean, it's, it's one of those, I suppose, quick legislative solutions that, you know, ultimately winds up resulting in yet another, you know, yet another harm that needs to be, be remedied because then people, you know, that because then the costs aren't internalized and, and someone, uh, you know, can damage another without paying the full cost of it. And you wind up with the distortion in the market of what resources should be used to what end because it's simply because someone doesn't have to have to pay the cost of, of their action. And, you know, that's, I guess, sort of a general description or general answer to your question. But yeah, uh, legislatively, limiting damages, uh, and some, of course, have applied to, to, to corporations generally, but uh, when government allows liability to be limited, it's, uh, you know, it, it creates distortions in the market and misallocation of resources, and you know, I tend to agree. Joe, I will leave you with one last question. I know that you know, personally, uh, Judge Andrew Napolitano, also a friend 
and a board member at the Mises Institute. He recently spoke at NPRI's annual dinner. You know, he gives a talk at the Mises Institute that really revolves around the famous Lochner versus New York case, which happened in 1905. Uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes had the famous dissent in that case. Can you just speak briefly about uh, sort of what that case and its dissent has meant for, for really for economic activity in the U.S.? Yeah, it's, you know, it really was the turning of the tide. Um, you know, I've, I've read some Mankins. He's really good on, on all of the Wendell Holmes. And, you know, people have tried to figure out, too, was, was, was Holmes a liberal? Was he a conservative? What, you know, they, of course, try and pigeonhole uh, Holmes. And, and what Mankin it, it, it explained is that really, uh, Holmes was just an extreme, uh, I don't know if this is even a word, but deferentialist. He was extremely deferential to whatever the, you know, whatever the legislatures tended to pass at the time. And of course, that's dangerous insofar as the courts are supposed to be a check on the tyranny of the majority. You know, there are certain things that no matter how big a majority support, well, of course, there's the constitutional amendment process, but I mean, philosophically, you know, no matter how many people think um, some right should be taken away, it's, you know, that's a right that's inherent to, you know, the individual uh, in the state of nature or, or, or you know, uh, you know God-given rights, sometimes people explain this, but in, in essence, the Lochner decision was sort of the beginning of the end, because shortly after that, he had the Nebian decision, which, uh, you know, one year, same constitution, no amendments, economic regulation of labor rates or maximum labor hours are, 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 are unconstitutional, and then, you know, just a couple of years later, in the court term, suddenly setting milk prices or, or uh, restrictions on milk production are are, are constitutional. And, and what really happened, and this is what I, I talked a lot about, I wrote a lot about in the, the law review article uh, uh, when I was in law school, is that when you give only rational basis scrutiny, you know, you know for your audience, I'll, exp- I'll explain basically what that was. Uh, courts will, in essence, pass on economic regulation if there's any conceivable benefit that legislature could have had for passing some regulation of people's, you know, private property or labor. Um, and it's not even necessary that they announce what that rationale is. The rational basis test simply means that the court is not going to strike down as unconstitutional legislation that may somehow, in the minds of some legislator, uh, have had a rational basis or some, even if it's not, about the only thing that, that uh, will get uh, stricken by the courts is unconstitutional for so-called pure economic regulation is something that is totally arbitrary and totally capricious. And that's a very difficult standard to meet. And remember, when you're litigating litigating against the government, they're given every presumption of legitimacy and the burden of proof is on the person challenging the economic regulation to win. Now, the other side of that coin, the so-called fundamental liberties, government has has the burden to show that uh, they're trying to satisfy some uh, compelling governmental interest, and they've chosen the least restrictive means by which to do that. Um, but, yeah, I mean, this was certainly the you know, the beginning of the end of, of, of economic liberty. And then, now, here we are, how many years later, not so many, not even 100 years later, and you've got you know, things like Obamacare, which require people to buy a product from a private company. I mean, even that probably would have not passed muster under you know, under the Nevia, the Nevia test, but you know, maybe maybe legislators were, weren't quite the bold as to even to pass such a thing as that. As that can be. Joe Becker, thanks so much for your time and for a fascinating interview. Ladies and gentlemen, have a great weekend.